Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Church at Home. This is Fred Coulter on Church at Home. We're sponsored by the Christian Biblical Church of God, and we are dedicated to bringing you original Christianity restored for today. Now, we've been going through an extended series of half-hour segments showing the truth about Sabbath-keeping, Old Testament and New Testament. And we've covered just about every single argument that people have brought up against the Sabbath. And we found that not one single argument has any real scriptural substance or foundation to it. However, there's one other scripture that needs to be covered. We find this in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Now, first of all, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read to you this particular verse in Hebrews 4. I'm going to read it to you in the King James Version, and then I will explain to you how it is explained by most Sunday keepers. And it's really quite deceptive and quite unique, because they claim this verse, Hebrews 4 and verse 9, tells us that Jesus kept the Sabbath for us. And isn't that wonderful that Jesus kept it for us, so therefore we don't have to keep it any longer? How could that be? Did Jesus keep the commandment, you shall not murder, so you can continue to murder and it won't come against you? Well, that's absurd. Of course it is. Did Jesus keep the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, so you can commit adultery? Now you're getting ridiculous. Of course. Because I want you to see that that kind of argument is completely baseless. And yet I saw on television one of the leading evangelists, he read a letter from a woman and said, oh, I'm so thankful that you explained it to me that Jesus is my Sabbath. And he kept the Sabbath for me, therefore, I don't have to keep the Sabbath. Isn't that wonderful? And the evangelist who read that letter had tears of joy in his eyes, and his wife was sitting next to him, affirming yes and nodding her head that this is true. And millions of people watch that, and they think, well, that's true. Is it? What is the truth concerning Hebrews? 4 and verse 9. And we need to read the verses before and the verses after. So I'm going to read it to you from the King James Version of the Bible. Verse 9, Hebrews 4. There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. A rest. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Hallelujah. I don't have to keep the Sabbath. Hallelujah, I don't have to keep the commandment, you shall not murder or commit adultery or lie or cheat or steal. Hallelujah, I can have idols all around because Jesus kept the commandments for me. Well, Jesus didn't keep any commandments for anyone because it wasn't his responsibility to keep them for you. It was his responsibility to open the way through God's Spirit and through his sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins that you, upon repentance and baptism, can receive the Holy Spirit of God, and you can keep the commandments of God in spirit and in truth and worship God in spirit and in truth. So how on earth did they ever get this kind of interpretation out of Hebrews 4 and verse 9. Well, it certainly doesn't conform to the original Greek. And let's understand that in the King James Version of the Bible, and this is my Bible of, what, some 40 years? There's bias by the translators, a bias against the Sabbath, a bias against Greek. 
That's why you find in 1 Corinthians 13, that is called the love chapter, they translate the Greek word agape, which means love, charity, because that's what it is in Latin. So you had Latinists there. So there are many bad translations in the King James Version of the Bible. That's why we have done this Bible, the Holy Bible in its original order, to be faithful to the Greek, to be faithful to the Hebrew, so that people can have a Bible that they can know. It's not politically motivated. It's not motivated to please a committee or to please the feminist or to please the homosexual community or to please the Catholics and the Protestants and the non-believers. No, it's done to reflect the truth of the Word of God. So let's read, beginning in verse 1, and I will explain it to you and explain the correct translation of Hebrews 4 and verse 9. Let's begin right here in verse 1. Therefore, we should fear lest perhaps a promise being open to enter into his rest, any of you should seem to come short. Now, the Greek word for rest here is katapazin, and that is the rest that the world is going to experience when Jesus Christ returns, the resurrection takes place, and the saints rule and reign with Christ to bring peace and rest to the earth. That's the goal. Now, the children of Israel, they rebelled in the wilderness and didn't keep the Sabbath and didn't keep the holy days the way that they should have, as you can read in Ezekiel chapter 20. And they didn't enter into the rest of the promised land because they sinned against God. Now, what is sin? Sin is a transgression of the law, correct? And even more particularly, is sin is lawlessness. And lawlessness comes in two forms. One, anti-law totally. And that's what most Christian ministers are against. All of the law of God. Therefore, lawlessness. Number two, that they create their own traditions and laws to replace the commandments of God, like the Jews and like the Catholics and like the Protestants. That's lawlessness. And they all think they're going to the kingdom of heaven. They're not, because they're doing the same thing that the children of Israel did in the wilderness. They rebelled against God. So Paul's saying, well, you better be careful if you want to enter in to the rest of the kingdom of God, then pay attention. Verse 2, for truly we had the gospel preached to us even as they also did, but the preaching of the word did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard. Now what does faith require? What is faith? Faith is belief and trust in God and his word and in Jesus Christ and in God the Father and in the promises of God. Faith. By grace you are saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Absolutely true, without a doubt. But what does faith require? Faith requires obedience. They didn't obey. They didn't have the faith to obey. They didn't choose to obey. Was it mixed with faith of those who heard? What kind of faith do you have? Do you believe God to obey? Well, you read Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham believed God and left his own country to go where God said, by faith. Noah built an ark. Faith requires work and active things to do after that. Everything that is of faith must have works behind it. And as James said, if you have faith and don't have works, you don't believe anything. Your faith is vain and empty. 
If you think you're going to receive eternal life and enter into the rest of Jesus Christ when the kingdom of God comes, you got another thought coming because it ain't going to happen. Verse 3, for we who have believed, we ourselves are entering into the rest. Progressively, we're preparing for the kingdom of God. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And what was the last work of God finished at the foundation of the world? Creation of the Sabbath day, the seventh day, correct? Yes. Now notice how he's talking about the seventh day Sabbath. There can be no mistaking what this is really saying with a proper and a correct translation and understanding. For he spoke in a certain place about the seventh day in this manner, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Genesis 2, correct? Yes. We're talking about Sabbath keeping. Now, what does the Sabbath picture as we will use a theological termination or lingo, what does it picture? The rest pictures the millennial rest that is coming, Christ, eschatological. Verse 5, and again concerning, if they shall enter into my rest. Very interesting, isn't it? If they shall enter into my rest. Now, have you ever thought about that what God has offered with salvation is conditional upon your obedience and love of God. If. Notice how he qualifies it here in the next verse. Verse 6, Consequently, since it remains for some to enter into it, and those who had previously heard the gospel did not enter in because of disobedience. No, they didn't. That is an example. The children of Israel who died in the wilderness and did not enter into the promised land is an example for us today that if we don't do what God says, we're not entering the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying here. All right, continuing verse 7. Again, he marks out a certain day. What is that certain day? The seventh day day. That's that certain day. Today, saying in David, after so long a time, exactly as it has been quoted above, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Will you hear the voice of God? Will you hear the commandment concerning the Sabbath of God? Will you listen? Will you obey? Will you love God? Will you worship him in spirit and in truth? What is it that you want to do? So there's an example for us. For if Joshua, now the King James says Jesus, but that should be Joshua. For if Joshua had given them rest, in other words, if their going into the promised land was the complete plan of God, it would have ended with that. He would not have afterwards spoken long afterwards of another day. Another day of what? Of the coming of the kingdom of God. Now, why didn't they enter in? Because they didn't keep the Sabbath. Why were they kicked out of the promised land? Because they broke the Sabbath. And the Jews were kicked out twice. Because they didn't keep the Sabbath. And to this very day, the Jews know which day is the seventh day, but they don't keep it in spirit and truth, and they reject Jesus Christ. They won't accept him as the Messiah, and most people foolishly believe that the Jews are just like Christians, except they don't believe in Jesus, and nothing could be further from the truth. You see, the truth is this. There is more confusion concerning religion than any other thing in the world, and that it is the root cause of all the problems in the world today. And all of it begins in the pulpit and with the teachers, with the ministers, or with the hearers. Oh, a lot of people, they don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear myths. They want to hear pleasant stories. Oh, wonderful human success. What does that have to do with loving God? 
See? This world is deceived. Now, I'm going to read you the proper translation of verse 9. Because the plan of God has not yet been fulfilled, and because the kingdom of God is not yet on this earth and is to come, now, verse 9, there remains, therefore, Sabbath keeping for the people of God. How did they get rest in the translation of the King James instead of Sabbath keeping? It's plain there in the Greek. The Greek word is sabotismos, which means Sabbath keeping, observing of the Sabbath. Now, you can go online to the Anchor Bible Dictionary, and you can look up Hebrews 4 and verse 9, and it will show you that sabotismus was universally understood in the time that this was written to mean Sabbath-keeping. Oh, but the prejudice of the translators of the King James Version of the Bible couldn't dare do that because that would be a chink in their, in their logic of keeping Sunday. And after all, we couldn't give up Sunday. How many people say the same thing today? There remains, therefore, Sabbath keeping for the people of God. Who are the people of God? Did it say, therefore, there remains Sabbath keeping for the Jews? No. Did it say there remains Sabbath keeping for the Israelites? No. There remains, therefore, Sabbath keeping for the people of God who are composed of Jews and Gentiles and Israelites all together. Did Paul preach to the Gentiles? Yes. Did he preach Sabbath keeping to them? Yes. Is he writing here to the people of God? and saying that Sabbath keeping is for the people of God. Some would say, well, this is the book of Hebrews, and it was written for the Jews and sent to the Jews. No, it was sent to every church, the people of God. Let's see how he defines it, verse 10. For the one who has entered into his rest, he has also ceased from his works, just as God did from his own works. When did God cease from his works? On the, when the Sabbath began, right? When are you to cease from your works? You have six days in which to labor and do all your work, and the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, correct? That's what it's talking about, yes. Verse 11, we should be diligent, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. This tells us what? In order to enter into the kingdom of God, when Christ returns, we have to be diligent in keeping the Sabbath every week, because that is how God is teaching and training us to prepare us as kings and priests to rule with Jesus Christ when he returns has nothing whatsoever to do with Jesus keeping the Sabbath for us. Is Jesus the people of God? Or is not Jesus the Savior of the people of God? Now you see how all of that falls by the wayside, right? Yes. Now let's come back here to the book of Isaiah. Let's see some scriptures that we need to look at here. So we can, we've already covered some of them, but let's go over them again. Let's understand what God says concerning Sabbath keeping for so-called Gentiles. Because most of the people say, well, we're a Gentile church and we keep Sunday. Well, God never said that. Jesus never said that. Apostles never taught it. How did people come up with such a ridiculous ideas? Because they wanted to keep Sunday. So you see, the truth is, the Protestant Reformation was like a separation gone bad. They never really left the basis of the Roman Catholic Church and Sunday keeping. The Protestants never completed the Reformation, and they kept Sunday and rejected the Sabbath. Now, Isaiah 56, let's pick it up here in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, 
Now, when it says, thus said the Lord, this is God speaking. Can we sit up and pay attention and take notice? These are the words of God. Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Righteousness is what? All the commandments of God are righteousness. Psalm 119, 172. Verse 2. Read this carefully. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps the Sabbath from profaning it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. And yet there are Protestant religionists who say, if you keep the Sabbath, you're under a curse. If you keep the Sabbath, you're under law. If you keep the Sabbath, you're trying to justify yourself by works. Wrong, 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 lie, lie, lie. Verse 3, do not let the son of the stranger who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people, and do not let the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. No. God is no respecter of person. This is New Testament doctrine, and this is the basis for teaching the New Testament, the basis for Paul teaching the Gentiles to keep the Sabbath. Do you understand that? All right. Verse 4, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, plural, because there are annual Sabbaths as well, and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even to them I will give within my house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons and daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. In other words, they are to keep the Sabbath to enter into the spiritual rest at the resurrection and return of Jesus Christ for an everlasting blessing and Sabbath keeping and eternal life and everlasting blessings go hand in hand, and that's exactly what Paul Paul was teaching back there in Hebrews 4 and verse 9. Therefore, there remains Sabbath keeping, Sabbatismos, for the people of God, Jew and Gentile, just like it is here in Isaiah 56, which was a prophecy of that very thing. Can you understand that? Can you believe that? Do these things that we've covered concerning the Sabbath give you understanding and motivation to read your Bible, to keep the Sabbath, to start in your home, to begin to find out where is God, who is God, how do I connect with God, how do I understand the Word of God? The key is the Sabbath, the seventh day called Saturday, from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. That is the day of God. Now, the world ignores it with pleasures and sports and sales and buying and selling and all of this kind of thing. But God says, keep my Sabbath. Now, come over here to Isaiah 58. Here is what God says that we need to do. It says in verse 1, cry aloud, spare not, Lift up your voice like a ram's horn and show my people their transgressions in the house of Jacob their sins. Oh, they have their religions. They seek me daily, but they won't do what I say. Are you religious? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you go to church on Sunday? Ask yourself, is this in truth or is this in vain? Why do I believe it? Have I proved it from the Bible? I challenge you to take one month and keep the Sabbath Every week for a month, block everything out and study the Word of God, study about the Sabbath, pray about it, ask God to give you understanding, turn off the television, turn off the games, turn everything off, and turn on to God on the Sabbath day in your own home. And I guarantee you, after one month, you will understand why you should keep the Sabbath. Here's what he says to do. Verse 13, Isaiah 58. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing your own desires on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor pursuing your own desires, nor speaking your own words. That's how to keep the Sabbath. That's the challenge to everyone at church at home. Do you believe God? Will you keep his Sabbath? God will delight in you 
and delight in hearing your prayers and seeing that you want to understand the truth, seeing that you're keeping the Sabbath in your own life. And that is just the first step in coming to having a relationship with God and one that needs to be continued all the, re the rest of your life. Notice verse 14, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you with the inheritance of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it, a guarantee to be in the kingdom of God. And it's all contingent upon Sabbath keeping in spirit and in truth. Will you accept the challenge? Why don't you write for these two booklets that we have? Which day is the true Christian Sabbath? Which is the true Lord's Day? And a Sabbath Sunday challenge you have never read. You need these two booklets so that you can begin to understand the truth of the Word of God like you have never understood it before. Now also, go to our website, cbcg.org, and there we have a series called Refuting Sunday Keeping, 12 hour and a half sermons that go into it far greater and greater detail than I have done here. And you need to know and understand those things. So thank you once again for inviting me into your home. And till next time, this is Fred Coulter saying so long, everyone. <laughs>